Amen. Yeah, I like that song. Yeah, Matthew West, it, it kind of acts like it takes his whole body for him to get that out of there, doesn't it? I mean, you just all into that. You know, I like that. That's good stuff. Well, how have you been doing as, as far as being sheep goes this week? You been thinking about being a sheep? We've looked at some scriptures of late. It says, all oh, we like sheep have gone astray. He said, that's the problem. Sometimes in being sheep, we get off track, don't we? And the trouble is when we get off track, according to the Proverbs, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Now, we got an idea as opposed to sticking close on the heels of the shepherd. We got an idea about how we ought to go, and it doesn't always turn out so good. And as a result, sometimes we can get ourselves in a mess. Experience any of that? I had Ken do a little research. We're going to start with some visual elements that will help us think about before and afters. <laughs> you, you, I don't know if anybody here, Rock, can you get any idea what year this one is? 57. There's somebody. Yeah, yeah, okay, 57. Now there's distinctive. Uh, features that would tell you that, right? And between a 55 or a 58 or different things. And I knew some of you guys would know. I've been around guys. But boy, oh boy, this poor old thing here over the before. Uh, that's just a mess. There's been some neglect. There's been some abuse. But then somebody with some skill got a hold of that, right? Here's another one. There's a song out there these days, it's a little older now, it says, I got a couple dents in my fender and a rip in my jeans, you know? <laughs> well, that poor old Jeep at the top, you know, the man, the transformation. I don't know about that. I'm not even sure you could get that Jeep into that shape. I just say, you know, I'm not completely sure of that. But I've seen some of those happen before. You go from that old thing that they may have found just sitting out in the fence row or buried in the back of a barn someplace, and the next thing you know, it's, it's parade ready. Right? <laughs> or a house. Lots of DIY examples on TV these days about how they'll find some dilapidated old beat up before and, and turn it into something really nice before they're all done with it. And sometimes I'm thinking, man, just give that dude a match or a little plunger of dynamite and start <laughs> over would be better, you know? But you get them in the right hands and they can work wonderful transformations. Now, obviously, we're not talking about cars, even 57s, or Jeeps, or trucks, or, boy, that's a pretty nice, that's a pretty nice before and after, isn't it? That's really not what we're concerned, but the before and after I really want you thinking about this morning, I'm not even sure we could get up here on this screen, but you can get it into your mind's eye, if you would. I want you to think about the condition of your soul. And on, on that old beat up, abused, neglected spectrum at one end when it looked like our before pictures to the after end where it's bright and shiny and polished and wow shape. Where would you fix your soul on that continuum this morning between the before and after? That's what we want to talk about this morning and we're going to do it from Psalm 23. The Lord, all caps, notice we, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that, that identifies it to us as the given name of God. He, he, he pronounced his name as I am, that I am to Moses, and that, that will be my name in, for, for, in, in moving forward. That's how I will be known, Yahweh, we, we call it. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in need. I'll have, I'll have everything I need because he is my shepherd. Now it's going to require some faith, right? Some trust that he's going to let me lie down in green pastures. He's going to lead me beside quiet waters. He'll restore my soul. For the first time now here in our series, he's sort of going to begin to venture out just a bit away from that notion of, of the sheep imagery. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, 
They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and faithfulness or mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And my dwelling will be in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23. The danger is that it is so familiar to us that we've squeezed the impact right out of it. We're working to linger long in it so that he can fill it back up for us. Let's pray and ask him to do that for us this morning. Father, we are thankful for the inspiration of your spirit so long ago in, in the heart and mind of David. To pin the words of this precious psalm. Lord, the problem we have is we we can get so familiar with it that we don't even hear what it is that we're saying or singing any longer. And so I pray this morning, Holy Spirit, that you will teach us, that you will open our ears and our eyes and our hearts, and that you will make sure that you get everything through to us that we need this morning. And especially it has, as it has to do with the condition of our souls and where we land in terms of better shape. Are we all beat up, buried in a barn someplace, or stashed on a fence road and forgotten, or are we sure and ready to reflect your glory so that people see you in us? Give us the courage to be honest enough with ourselves to get ourselves plotted on that continuum today and, and to come to you, Jesus, our great shepherd, for that which only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. He restores my soul. When we think about that word restore, we often go to those before and afters. We find something all worn out and beat up and abused and forgotten and left for worthless and then put back into prime mint condition. Restoration. And I think that's all in that word, as they would have heard it. But I think it's possible now that literally thousands of years have passed that I think there are some other things that may have been included in that, in that concept of restoration for them when they heard that word. And so I've, I've been working on trying to squeeze some of that out for us this week and uh, have landed on a couple of other words that may be helpful for us to maybe get to round out that notion of the restoration of our soul. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it a little different than I did at the early service. I never know for sure how it's going to come out, but I, I want to see if I can't help us get a grasp, get some handles on that notion of soul first. You know, how do we distinguish the soul from the other parts of who we are? Sometimes soul and spirit and heart and mind and, and, and the intellect and the emotions in, in the biblical data, that sort of almost seems to run interchangeably. And you can't always tweak it out exactly. For me, some working, um, working order of things at this point, the best I can tell you right now is this, that I tend to approach it in this way, that I differentiate between the animate and the inanimate parts of who I am, the, the physical and the spiritual parts of who I am. And so when I think about the animate, my body, you know, the earth suit that God has given us, that we are able to function on this earth with this body, and as long as it's still operational, we're good to go, yes? When it ceases to be operational, our time here is kaput. <laughs> we're out of here. So there's that part of us, the physical, our bodies, the animate. But then there's the inanimate, inanimate, the unseen. And that's where I think rests this whole notion of our, of what the Bible will use words like our heart and our spirit, our mind, our emotions, that spiritual being of us that we know is very real and it's in here, but it's, it's not the same as this. There is that, that inanimate part of us as well. But 
but at this point, the best grasp I have is, is how then does the soul connect with that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define the soul for us as that part of us that God put within us. It is the capacity to experience relationship with him that distinguishes us from all of the other created animate life forms out there. You know, as much as you love your dogs and your cats and your critters and all that, I'm going to tell you, there's no soul there. No capacity for a relationship with God. Adam and Eve had one from the very beginning. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living person. Person there is the same word in Psalm 23 that we, that we translate soul. Nefesh. When God breathed into him the breath of life, man became a living soul. Full-blown capacity and capability to know God in a relationship with him. And they had that and they experienced that life with him until they crossed that one line that God gave them. Of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat from the day you eat of it you will surely die but they ate that fruit and this touchable tangible body continued to live they still had intellect emotion spirit they still had all that but I'm going to contend with you what died was their soul their relationship with God it was obliterated. They were separated from him by their sin, by their disobedience. He was no longer present. Now the capacity was still there. They still had a soul, but it laid dead within them. And had it not been for the love of God that prompted a plan that would bring Jesus to this earth, to suffer and die in our place, to pay the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. The holiness of God must be satisfied. And so Jesus came, the God-man who had life to give. He had life and he could die as both God and man. And he came and he did. And he gave us the opportunity to be, listen, the opportunity to be born again. That part of you that was designed for the relationship with God that lies dead within you, when you place your faith in Christ, when you entrust, entrust your eternal destiny to him and his death and resurrection, then we are, as the scripture says, born again. It's a decision we each have to make. I can't make it for you. You decide that you want that part of you to be alive again, that you want that relationship with God he will not impose that upon us. He simply makes it available to us as a gift of his grace. And when we place our faith in Christ, life is there again. We begin that journey of knowing him that we will experience all the way through this earthly life and will not know in, in, in its fullness until we finally are with him. In the meantime, we are tenders of our souls. We tend our souls. Sometimes we invest adequately and appropriately, and it seems as if our soul and our relationship with God that we experience there is vibrant and alive, and sometimes not so much. And we find ourselves in need of the shepherd's restoration of our soul. We find ourselves in the very beginning with an old beat up, you know, before picture. He's got big plans. There were a couple of additional words as I studied that Hebrew word for restore, restore there this week that sort of helped me get my arms around the concept. 
when they would have heard this word restore that was used here, there were a couple of other words that could have very much been a part of their mind. One was refresh. Another was repair. And as I sat this week and thought about those notions of, of God, uh, of our shepherd restoring our soul, that sometimes my soul feels a little parched. How about yours? Man, it needs refreshed. Feels a little famished. Feels as if it's dried up a little around the edges. Not necessarily through anything that I've done wrong. And so when I think about refreshment, it is simply a depletion that occurs through normal activities of life. Through the course of the day, I find myself thinking, man, I could use a drink. Where did I put my tea glass? <laughs> And I've been doing something real strenuous, maybe a little exercise, or they're back in the day when I was much more sound than I am these days. I'd show up, I got a buddy that kept, kept animals and he'd be to bale hay, and I'd go down and help him just for fun. There's something not quite right at the time. He just couldn't get help, and so I could help. You know, any old knothead could work up in the barn, you know, so that's where I'd go. And we'd throw bales until my arms were cut and scratched, and I was covered from head to toe in chaff. And whenever we'd get a wagon unloaded, man, we were all about fail, bailing out of that barn head for the water hydrant. And we'd turn that bad boy on and let it run until it got cold. And as much as you, as you could get under that hydrant, you'd stick it under there, and then you'd start drinking. That's what I wonder if you're here this morning, your soul just feels thirsty. The shepherd would be happy to refresh your soul. He has what you need for, for you just to swell up again. Everything that you need. You know, to sit down to a good meal when you're just famished and, and you eat and you can just feel life returning to your body again. That's what the shepherd can do for your soul. Sometimes we just, we, just, we just need him to refresh us. But listen, here's, here's another important word. In order for him to do that, it's going to require proximity. You're going to have to get up next to him. You're going to have to get close. You can't settle for just knowing about him. You're going to have to lean in and welcome that refreshment that only he can provide. <coughs> refreshment, I think, is a subset of that notion, that imagery of restoration that we saw on the screen a bit ago. But sometimes it, it's more like repair. That our soul needs some repair. That's a depletion that comes as a result of neglect or abuse. It's not depletion that's come just from doing life, but rather you've been careless and you've neglected your soul. You've given yourself to other things that are not worthy of your soul's investment, and as a result, you've neglected them. You've pushed so long for so hard, chasing after something that you were sure was what you needed, and now you need repair. You know? Neglected your soul, you have not tended it. Did, did a wedding yesterday from a nephew, and uh, and I, I made sure he understand. Listen, dude, marriage is not like the auto steer on the tractor. You don't get in there and just hit the resume button and go on about something else till you get to the end and get a little attention. You got to commit to this and make it work, buddy. You know. So too your soul care. You can't get away with just. Neglecting it, it needs your attention. Your relationship with Jesus requires your attention. He's not going to impose that on you because if you work hard to convince him, you're not all that concerned about a relationship with him. He'll say, well, okay, sheep, wander away, and I'll be here when you're ready to come back, and, and I'll refresh your soul. I'll repair your soul. That has happened as a result of neglect. But sometimes we need repair because there has been abuse. Somebody has hurt us. Somebody has taken advantage of us. 
sometimes with very evil intentions, you know? They just mean and nasty and, and they just they just cut a rut right through your soul. I'm, I'm, the shepherd can repair that if you've come in contact with that kind of abuse. Sometimes it's not even with ill will that they abuse us. It's just, just common everyday selfishness that we come in contact with people and they just hurt us. Shepherd says, I will, I will repair that hurt in your soul, that wound that you carry. And sometimes we just want to slough it off and not even acknowledge, oh, it's not that big a deal. Dude, it didn't really hurt. No, oh, don't worry about that. You know, and then you're left with scar tissue that just the right set of circumstances, it gets poked, and yikes, that still hurts. Shepherd knows all about that. And he'll be happy to repair that wound in your soul. If you'll just give him opportunity to do so, he will be delighted. He'll be delighted to, to do that for you. You haven't forgot about that continuum of the before and after, have you? Have, have you taken a risk to get your soul charted on that continuum? somewhere it, it, it can be it, it can be a little intimidating you have to say you know what I kind of look like those old beat up trucks <laughs> it's kind of how I'm feeling it's going to be important that we are willing to take that assessment prior to coming to the shepherd so that we can come to him and just be honest I need some restoration. I need some refreshment. I need some repair. And when we do, when we come to him with that, there's one thing that I think will be vitally important for us to acknowledge, and we're going to find that referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, Paul says, with great confidence, we do not lose heart. I think I can be prone to lose heart. How about you? You know, I think Paul's going to give us the, some key information that's vitally important for us to be able to join Paul in making that statement of, we don't lose heart, and here's why. Though our outer person is decaying, yes? Anybody aware of the decay of the outer man, you know, the old physical body? Yes, it is on its way out, you know. Now, uh, decaying, that just sort of sort of communicates a stench. Hopefully you're not that bad of shape yet. But we're just on our way out of here. Yet, in the middle of all that nastiness, our inner person, our soul is being renewed day by day. You see, there's the perspective of the kingdom. The reason we can keep swinging, the re reason we can stay engaged in the fight, as Paul says, the reason we don't lose heart, yeah, obviously our bodies are wearing out, but there's part of us that's getting better every single day. Thanks to the restoration of the shepherd upon our souls. Yes, he says, for our momentary light affliction. That's the stuff going on here and now. It is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. One of the key realizations as he brings restoration to our soul, as he refreshes and repairs us, is he will increasingly begin to shift our attention away from the stuff that we're dealing with now to the stuff that's coming. And how much better it will be when the fullness of all that finally arrives. That's why we don't lose heart. We know the best is yet to come. 
And in the meantime, we continue to look to and follow the shepherd. We continue to expect by faith that he will move us from this old beat up, dingy, unloved and abused, misused and mistreated before picture until he has restored the glean and sheen of showroom quality to who we are. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. As I experience the restoration of my soul, what will begin to happen is I will increasingly be characterized by more of him and less of me. Paths of righteousness. He's going to lead me paths of righteousness. I, I'm getting better <laughs> at being like him than I used to be. I'm more like him than I used to be. How? Well, those momentary light afflictions, they're producing that in me. The tough stuff that we go through are all about helping us, our souls conform more to the image of Jesus leading me in paths of righteousness. I'm not like I used to be. The idea is I ought not be today like I was yesterday. He's making progress. I'm not going to settle for that old dude. Less of him and more of you. So that people will be impressed and who and on say, whoa, look at you. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. They don't say, they don't say, man, Scott, you're something else. They say, wow, what a work God's done in you. Huh. For his name's sake. It's all just reflecting glory to him. He restores my soul. Proximity is required for me to get for my soul the refreshment and the repair I need. I need it daily. I need to lean into him. I need to consistently communicate from my heart to his. And my relationship with him matters more to me than anything else. And I'm willing to demonstrate that by the way I live my life, by the rhythms that I build into my life that give him access to who I am so that he can tinker. He says, hey man, we, we got some bondo back here. This, it don't look right. We got that's gotta go. You know, that, that's just not gonna do. And look at this scratch back over here. No, that's good. And hopefully he's beyond, you know, replacing body parts at this point. I get very much more of that. <laughs> to put those rhythms of relationship into place on a regular basis in my walk with him, this is just more him shining through all the time. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I want, I want you to know him. I want that relationship to matter more to you than anything else. I'm glad that you and I have some relationship. That's not the most important part. You need a relationship with Jesus. Because what your soul's missing right now, what it's crying out and desperate for, is more proximity to Jesus closer to him. I've chosen a uh, contemplation song for us. I want you to keep thinking about where you're landing on that continuum. If you could get your soul on this screen, what would it look like? What is the condition of your soul today? And if you 
realize that you're in need of some restoration, some refreshment, maybe some repair, then I, I'm pointing you to the Good Shepherd, Jesus. He is who you need. Okay. That's my old buddy Crowder. The title of this new album is Milk and Honey. That's the imagery. I'm convinced that that song is telling us the truth and am experiencing the results of Jesus being that in my life. But I would acknowledge that maybe you aren't yet convinced. Give him a chance to show you. Just, just open that Psalm 23 up and give him a chance to show you that he is a shepherd that you can trust. And that if you'll make him your shepherd, you'll have everything you need, including restoration of your soul and paths of righteousness to walk in for his name's sake, his glory. He is. Jesus, thank you that you have everything we need. And that as we look to you and your timing, you fill our soul. May we walk in faith and believe that to be true. There may be some first initial steps for some folks this week to look to you as good shepherd to restore, refresh, repair their soul. You make yourself known to them, won't you? Let them experience the reality of all that Jesus is in some new ways. Life-changing ways this week. The world needs to see Jesus. He is worth seeing. May your church arise and let him be seen in all of his glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Let's go be the church. Have a great week.